Genshin's meta has been progressing and evolving all throughout his timeline. Despite my videos on how I feel like the game is well stagnant or unevolving, the one part of it that has been going through a lot of changes thankfully are the characters, the heartbeat of this game. Gacha games are known for incentivizing players to collect them all, having a negative consequence of putting pressure on you to impulse purchase, but also having a positive consequence of roster diversity, especially when done so thoughtfully. And Genshin has one of the most colorful cast of characters I've seen in any gacha title. Their interactions with each other, as well as their usage of elemental reactions, giving rise to a lot of ways to mix and match teams that makes the game more complex than meets the eye, although I still wish they could tap into its vast potential a lot more. Nevertheless, with the game well into version 4, I wanted to discuss where Genshin's meta is headed based on its initial lineup of characters, as well as form an educated guess using prior information. I know I already foreshadowed this in Linny's video on mono elemental teams and Nivellet, but today we'll be looking at things in a broader sense. The game's meta development has taken place over a number of stages, which often happens in games that continuously release new characters, equipment, and bosses on a regular basis. For most of version 1, the community was running around like headless chickens, with no rhyme or reason on what characters they used. Everyone mostly played what little they had, and a lot of premature guesses were being thrown around on which characters were good and which ones weren't. But since the game just came out and we had so few units of every element and weapon type, there wasn't a clear understanding of where everything stood in relation to each other. For instance, Diluc was the gold standard of what we believed to be strong, but then Hu Tao came out who we thought was the pinnacle of Genshin, then Shogun came out which pushed the bar even higher, then Nahida, and then I'll hate them and it just kept getting higher and higher. For the most part, version 1 was a period of just figuring stuff out, figuring where everyone and everything stood, figuring out and learning Genshin's mechanics, combat systems, and how to exploit those combat systems to the absolute limit. By version 2, we now had a general understanding of how the game is meant to be played, and how every character is meant to be viewed, evidenced by the early part of version 2 marking the time when proper teams were not only used, but made universally known to all players, casual and hardcore alike. Information was being circulated and disseminated, and central databases were created for everyone to have convenient access to reliable, trusted, and well-researched material for characters and teams. So basically we went from a primitive Wild West period to the start of civilization and growth. Coinciding with the community's developing knowledge was the addition of more characters to the roster that expanded on our viewpoints of elements and their functions. Units like Goro, Sada, and Shunhe for element-exclusive support that later helped us understand Nilu. Characters like Ayato and Shogun who gave us more awareness of the power of elemental reactions, Kokomi, Yelan, Yaimiko, and Shinobu expanding on Hydro and Electro in preparation for Dandro's arrival in version 3. It was a big stepping point for the meta, where before it was four individual characters put together doing their own thing, to four characters working in tandem with one another to achieve a gestalt, a collective greater than the sum of its individual parts. The first half of version 3 was all about applying what we knew about the game up until that point into the new meta-shaking element, Dendro, which completely threw the balance of Genshin on its head, presenting entirely new reactions and retroactively shifting the value of characters based on how well they can make use of this elevated damage floor. Moreover, Dendro served as sort of the great equalizer, where back then it felt like some elements were valued a lot more than others, now it feels like every element, with the exception of Geo, poor thing, has a strong incentive to be used. The majority of version 3's new units were primarily focused on Dendro, as it was a new roster needed being fleshed out, so they gave us our damage dealers, our supports, and our healers. The second half was more interesting in my opinion, since in hindsight it was alluding to a potential new direction Mihoya wanted to take for the game that was basically confirmed in 4.0. Units like Wanderer, Farza, Nika, Candice, and Dia had very unorthodox movesets, even when pitted against the comparably creative playstyles of their predecessors. Mika was the first true physical support, an archetype we haven't seen in almost two years at that point. Candice's main draw was a normal attack augmentation, and specifically hydro imbuing and counter tanking, two things we also haven't seen in a very long time. Wanderer and Farzan called attention back into Animo as a DPS element, not a support, reinvigorating discussion and theorycrafting on Xiao in the process, while Dia, despite having the most disappointing release of all time, had no shortage of unique mechanics to her like her cover tanking with her skill, off-field pyro application, and even her strange elemental burst. And if you think about it, Dendro's effect on the Electro element adhered to the same dynamic of what if we saw an element in a different way. At first I thought Mihoyo was just fooling around with random ideas, not really thinking about whether we needed them or not, but maybe in retrospect, all of the weird movesets they were playing around with were to test the waters for version 4, where they would really kick off the next stage of Genshin's meta. So version 1 was the figuring things out stage, version 2 was the elemental reactions and team comp stage, and version 3 was the dendro stage, what is version 4? Based on the units we have so far, and what a number of enterprising players have took upon themselves to pursue forbidden information that us mortal eyes are not yet meant to bear witness to, version 4 will be the quote-unquote off-meta stage, the year of anti-meta. Not to say that version 4 units are going to render existing strategies and teams irrelevant, but a side effect of the first three years of the game is that both we as a community and the game have sort of established the criteria in which to grade characters based on their elements. 
For example, if you were a Hydro unit, you were mostly evaluated on how well you could apply Hydro for the many powerful reactions to synergize with. If you were a Geo unit, you were evaluated on how much copium you gave Ito means. If you were an Electro unit, you were judged by either how fast you could apply Electro for Aggravate and Taser, or how consistently you could set off Hyperbloom. For Cryo, it was how well you could help Ayaka and Ganyu Freeze, stuff like that. This meant that if and when a unit came out that functioned differently from the status quo, they would be viewed less favorably on account of them deviating away from our preconceptions. The thought of a hypercarry unit like Wander felt out of place when this was the era of reactions and whatnot. But now, what version 4 appears to be aiming for are two things. To expand on the rules of every element, as previously hinted by Farazan, and add more off-the-cuff mechanics like they attempted with Dia. Linny's inclusion was Genshin's first outward attempt at a mono-element team since Geo. Granted, it was something the player base has dabbled around with, such as Triple Electro or Klee's Mono Pyro team, but it had yet to be formally introduced until Linny, whose skin explicitly necessitates a Mono Pyro team, and even his personal weapon incentivizing being used on a character who can run Mono Element teams. Not only that, but assuming I'm not giving them more credit than they deserve, Mihoyo now knows what is needed to make these divergent playstyles keep up with the current power ceiling of the game. Aware that a Mono Pyro team forfeits convenient and consistent access to powerful amplifying reactions that can increase your damage to staggering heights, they chose to allocate a portion of that expected gain into Linny. So if Hutal ranges from 100% to 200%, Linny starts off at 150% out of consideration for him getting less from reactions. I talked about this in more detail in this video, but to recap, Conclusive Ovation grants him up to a 100% damage boost to enemies affected by Pyro, essentially passively granting him the 1.5 or 2 times multiplier from Vaporize or Melt. If instead of 100% it was only 50%, then Linny would be significantly weaker. And one of the things I said when designing Hyper Carries was that you had to give them a higher baseline to make up for the lower damage floor. If you give them the same baseline, they're going to be infinitely worse than Reaction Carries. Fremine also touches on this off-meta approach by revolving around cryo and physical damage with a focus on Shatter, a reaction we thought was long gone. Unfortunately, as a 4 stem main damage dealer and therefore pretty much doomed to be trash, he's not making any headlines, but he's still living proof that Mihoyo is trying to raise new ideas on how to play certain elements. The last time we even remotely thought about Shatter was... Well, honestly, we never thought about Shatter, I don't think. Cryo has always been known for chain freezing, only coincidentally synergizing with physical damage by way of superconduct. Character number 3 on this quest to try fun stuff, and currently the most successful rendition of that, is Nouvellet. While Hydro had on-field damage in the form of Child and Ayato, both of them were very much beholden to their element in some shape or form. Child's international team revolves around Bennett and Kasaha super buffing both him and Shangling for good old fashioned vaporized damage. With Shangling actually being the real star of the show, it's just that Child sits there while giving her the Hydro she needs, and also doing good damage on the side. Meanwhile, Ayato's flexible Hydro application enables him to basically achieve any freaking Hydro reaction you can ask for. Hyper Bloom, Burgeon, Taser, Vaporize, Soup, Overvape, Nilo Bloom, Freeze, you name it, he could do it. Now, whether he was the best at it or not is a different matter entirely, but point being, Ayato and Child were on-fielders, but you really couldn't call them hyper carries in the literal sense of the word, even though I personally consider Child one. Nevelet, however, is straight up a hyper carry. His entire kit gives off a clear, unambiguous impression that he is indubitably a hyper carry. He requires extended on field time for his hydro pump. Everything in his arsenal serves to enhance the damage of said hydro pump from the source water droplets to his two passive talents. Heir to the Ancient Sea's authority directly boosting his hydro pump damage based on hydro elemental reactions, and Discipline of the Supreme Arbitration buffing his hydro damage based on his current health, with the idea that the rest of his team should get those reactions off for him easily and buff his damage to make each blast of water hurt as much as humanly possible. This approaches a hydro element in the complete opposite way from what version 1, 2, and especially version 3 taught us that hydro was meant to support other elements. The presence of Nivellet's talent turns the tables around to where other elements are meant to support him, and just like they do with Linny, they elevated his damage floor and ceiling to account for the fact that assuming you're playing him for hyper carry, it's kind of hard to consistently pull off most reactions that aren't Taser or Swirl. That's not to say Nivellet can't be used in Bloom, Freeze, or even Vaporize, that's just by virtue of Hydra's fluidity. But design-wise, he was meant to be an on-field, I am the main character of the anime, everyone's trash beneath me type of guy. And he's really, really f***ing good at that. Pyro, an element so intertwined with amplifying reactions to not use either of them. Hydro, an element so faithfully serving as the enabler of other elements to be selfish for a change. Cryo, an element so reliant on his permafreezing capability having that expectation... <clears throat> Shattered. Obviously, this is mostly conjecture. I'm not saying that's without a doubt what Mihoyo is doing for 4.0, but considering three of the first four characters of version 4 all have a very noticeable premise, plus the fact that Fontaine's making us get over our hydrophobia by not letting us drown if our stamina runs out while underwater has me theorizing that Genshin's meta will continue to go down that path. Navia hasn't come out yet, but she's the first Geo character we're getting, so you know for a fact, she better do something crazy if they harbor any illusions of making that godforsaken element viable again. 
Now, Risley doesn't exactly break any preconceived notions of Cryo, but instead he tries a different playstyle, kind of like Wanderer, where he enters a stance effect that changes his normal attacks while his passive town bosses charge attack, which might give him room for a burn melt or reverse melt team, something we haven't gone back to outside of Ganyu, and Cryo's also been mostly neglected throughout version 3. Plus, we haven't had a normal attack oriented Cryo user yet. Ganyu is charge attack or off-field control, while Ayaka is burst. Something you might be wondering if I'll ever get to is the existence of self-inflicted damage. So many of Fontaine's units have to pay health costs to use their abilities, placing even more emphasis on the need for healers, which I'm guessing is a reactionary effect to shielders being broken as all hell for version 1, 2, and even part of 3. But they're aware of this, and making it so while extra healing is always appreciated, they're giving every unit a form of self-sustain. Whether they're good or bad, Mihoyo seems to be learning from the lacking designs of past units and making sure these ones don't feel counterintuitive to use. Furthermore, the new artifact set, whose name I refuse to try and pronounce until I learn it correctly, increases normal and charge attack damage and increases crit rate by an incredible 36% when HP increases or decreases 3 times. These are phenomenal bonuses to give to units like Nivellet, who's very obviously going to fluctuate in health, and that 36% is very generous for how easy, albeit niche of an activation condition it is. Blizzard Strayer grants up to 40% crit but only against frozen enemies, which can be a lot less consistent. One more thing is that Lenny, Novelette, and Risley all require noticeably higher field time than the reigning team comps of old. For the majority of versions 2 and 3, we've been in a rotation-based meta where you swap out from one character to another and refresh buffs, then go ham on everything for a couple of seconds before doing it all over again. And one major challenge of getting hyper carries to work was that the need for extended field time, commonly in the double digits, caused inconsistent output, especially if their supports couldn't sustain their off-field buffs and effects for the same amount of time. Though that is still going to be an issue until we get more long-lasting supports, it's an interesting note to make that we're veering away from quick swap teams and sort of going back to the days of one character running point and staying on field killing everything. I'm really looking forward to seeing what the other T's characters like Navia, Clorinde, and Charlotte will bring to the table, as well as of course Farina. I think it's actually great for Mihoyo to push the boundaries of what every element could do because while it's good for each element to have a distinct function and purpose, that can also suffocate units into having to follow their element's creed or be useless. For example, Geo has been abandoned for a long time in light of how bad it is, but that could be alleviated by introducing overpowered Geo characters that couldn't care less about the absence of a proper reaction. Just like how C6 Farazan made it so Shao and Wander can mostly rely on their own power instead of being held down by Animal's only reaction not having the best damage output. So long as they still allow for a distinct purpose for each element, this is a fantastic direction for the game's new characters, and it's also arguably the best way for them to buff older characters too. If they release actual physical support, the Yulamates might finally restore their faith in humanity. On a side note, one avenue I hope they look into is attack speed. Attack speed is often overlooked in favor of just pure attack or damage amplification, but it would be cool to stack like 200% attack speed on a character and turn them into a walking machine gun. There is a ton of room for exploration in these departments. From a gameplay perspective, version 4 might make Genshin more interesting, not gonna lie. I just hope they follow through with it and expand more on the game's meta. I said this before and I'll say it again. Genshin's gameplay has so much potential, they just need to tap into it and delve deeper into it. Anyways, that's gonna be it for today. TLDR, my conspiracy theory is that we're entering a counterculture meta, and that might make the game refreshing to play. So keep an eye out over the next few months to see if I'm right on that or not. As always, if you enjoyed the video, I encourage you to like, subscribe, and share this with your friends. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Farsvarum, join my Discord server, and check out my other discussion videos if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.